And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project that we've been working on to try to address the needs of people like Adam, wherever you are, Adam. <laughs> and, um, you know, we talk about prevention, and typically when we frame prevention, we frame it as um, wanting to reduce the risk of harm to victims. And, of course, there are many, many many compelling reasons to focus on the risk of harm to victims. Um, you've heard about the increased risk of child sexual abuse um, engenders for serious mental health problems like PTSD and anxiety and depression. Uh, victimization increases the risk for physical health problems like hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, it's one of the ACEs, the uh, adverse childhood events, that shortens the lifespan, that's, you know, that's associated with a shorter lifespan. Um, being abused actually increases your risk for sustaining subsequent abuse later in life in adolescence and adulthood. There are an enormous financial costs. We had uh, Derek Brown here last year at our symposium. He and his team had estimated that the cost of child abuse and neglect in general is about $210,000 uh, over the life course of victims. Derek and his uh, team have joined the Moore Center and we've recently completed analyses estimating the cost specific to child sexual abuse, and it's about $310,000 per uh, victim over the course of, uh, over the life course of a victim. Um, we know of uh, potential collateral casualties um, to the first degree relatives, the parents, the siblings, uh, the children of, of victims. And so uh, we, we absolutely must prevent child sexual abuse because of the harm to victims, but there is also, um, harm to offenders. Many, many people who have offended don't want to. You saw um, a video of uh, someone who I think we could call a reformed offender that Fred Berlin showed right before lunch. And um, uh, certainly uh, many boys who are convicted of sex offenses um, face lengthy prison sentences, uh, public registration and notification. Uh, residence restrictions, employment restrictions. Andy Harris mentioned many of these consequences. Um, boys uh, under the age of 18 account from anywhere from 36 to 50 percent of all perpetrators of child sexual abuse. So this is a, a teenage phenomenon. Teen uh, it, it's a child phenomenon. Um, and boys who don't offend but who find themselves attracted to young children, that's a small percentage. There's, we don't believe there's ma very many people who are preferentially attracted to young children. But for those people who there are, and particularly for the adolescents, they suffer enormously. These quotes are from quotes uh, from, from discussions I've had with the young men that, that Luke put me in touch with. Um, these kids uh, go through adolescence with its normal ups and downs, but with uh, this awful internalization of the stigma of being a monster. And I think, um, we could do a lot to both address their desire to not offend and their, their commitment to not offending, but also to address the need for them to develop into healthy, happy young people. There is um, a model for this in Germany. The Prevention Project Dunkelfeld has been going on since 2005. And this is a project that actively reaches out to um, people who are living with sexual attraction to children and who want help for it, uh, including people who have and have not ever offended. Um, Dunkelfield means dark field, and they uh, envision this attracting people who are living in the dark field, uh, particularly those who have offended but who haven't been caught. Um, but it also is for people who have not offended and who don't want to. It started in 2005 uh, with some really great advertising. Uh, their advertising was funded by Volkswagen, I think. So they had very professional um, television and, and internet and radio ads reaching out to adults who uh, maybe were more interested in children than they should be. And if you are, please call this number. They've had more than 4,000 people call them. When they started out, the demand was so large that in a couple of years, um, they had to add four new sites in Germany, and then they had to add five more sites in Germany to meet the demand for services. Um, 
I've heard the director of that program, Klaus Beer, um, speak several times at professional conferences and asked him about uh, engaging in some similar work but with adolescents in the United States and he very strongly supports this project and he, is, he and his team have collaborated or consulted with us on it. And then I approached the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, ATSA, which is a organization and organization with a very strong prevention uh, mission. And I asked them to collaborate with me and they have. They've been very willing and helpful partners on this project. Um, these are the names of our, our named partners and I just want to point out that these um, people who are, who are um, collaborators on this project span um, juvenile justice, international justice, um, victim advocacy, prevention, experts, policy makers, researchers, uh, people with expertise with child sexual behavior problems and people with expertise uh, with uh, juvenile sexual offending. So we, we've tried to include all of the possible stakeholders we could think of to make sure that we can engage those communities as we move forward on this project. Um, as I said, uh, we envision an intervention, it's not developed yet, um, but we envision an intervention that meets the needs of uh, youth attracted to younger children um, and who are committed to not acting on those attractions and we see two broad areas of intervention. First and foremost to ensure that these young people have the tools and the skills and the wherewithal um, to keep themselves and others safe by not engaging young children in sexual behavior and, and of equal importance um, is to ensure that they develop the self-respect and the self-esteem that, that characterizes healthy and productive uh, young people. Um, we envision a, a kind of four steps to, to getting to, through to the end of an intervention that we hope we can make available one day. And the first is to start with interviews with uh, people like Adam, uh, who's a consultant on this project, um, and others to talk about what what would you have benefited from as an adolescent? What would have helped you um, stay safe and be happier and, and healthier? And before Luke introduced me to Adam and several other people who were part of Adam's um, self-help group, I had never spoken to someone who was attracted to children but who had not offended. All of my knowledge across 25 years was based on uh, um, doing research and clinical work with people who came to me through the juvenile and the adult criminal justice systems, people who had been caught, people who had already decided to offend. And that's true for my field. Almost everything we know is based on the people who get caught. We have very little understanding of the scope of folks who are out there living with these uh, afflictions, with these unwanted attractions, and not engaging in, in harmful behaviors. Um, so it was, uh, fundamentally uh, important for me and, and helped a fundamental shift in the way I think um, after Luke introduced me to Adam and others. Um, so the first qualitative piece is actually, um, we're gearing up to get that underway. We have an institutional review board proposal. They have a few questions for us, <laughs> 15 questions for us. So I'll be meeting with them in a couple weeks, but our, our institutional review board at IRB has been um, wonderfully helpful and strong uh, partner in all of our research at the Moore Center. So I, I'm confident that we'll get through um, whatever the, the snags might be. And um, uh, we also need to really carefully design the um, assessment and the intervention pieces and the, and the materials that we will use for outreach. Um, Joan Tabachnik is in our audience. She's a prevention specialist in this, in this space and, and she's got the lead on that particular piece of this, but as you can imagine, we want to and need to engage carefully with the community so that we have support. It would be very easy, I think, for someone, if somebody wanted to, to deep six this kind of research, and we want to avoid that. Um, and then uh, as we go through the standard steps of uh, the public health approach to violence or prevention, we are going to take uh, the intervention that we design and subject it to some feasibility testing to see is this palatable with the stakeholders, with the users, um, with young people and their families, and um, are there ways we can tweak it to make it better and then eventually subject it to a larger scale randomized control trial. At present, this is an unfunded project. Um, we're looking to partner with foundations. There's 
I don't believe at the moment a, a government funding agency that would be willing to tackle this particular problem. Um, but a couple of foundations have reached out to us. Um, uh, nobody's signed a check yet, um, but we're hopeful that we can get some funding um, to at least get us through the first couple of um, stages. And then we think if we've got a decent looking um, intervention uh, with a little bit of feasibility behind it, uh, we might be able to engage with some government um, funding agencies. And that's what it'll take. Um, uh, feasibility studies are expensive and randomized control trials are very expensive and unlikely to be funded at, um, without governmental support. And, you know, this is where we want to end. We want to end with an effective intervention that youth and their families can safely access and use, that can be broadly disseminated with fidelity um, in the U.S. and perhaps elsewhere, with safe, healthy, and happy youth who know that they are more than their attractions, and who are confident in their ability to keep themselves and to keep others safe. I, I want to acknowledge the tremendous impact that Luke's reporting has had on this topic. Um, he, he mentioned some of this, but I, I think it bears repeating. Um, you know, first of all, again, you know, he, he really contributed just to my growth as a, a scientist and as a clinician by getting to meet and speak with now many, many people who are in the space of living with a, an attraction that they don't want and figuring out how to navigate it. Um, he mentioned that, you know, millions of people have listened to the, um, the uh, This American Life uh, Help Wanted episode and, and read the Matter, dot, the Matter Magazine article. Um, he gets um, emails, hundreds of emails. I get hundreds of emails, phone calls, uh, letters. Um, just the volume of the response is remar mar remarkable. I've been on... Um, uh, NPR a few times and PBS and um, Radio Science and, and some pretty, you know, some shows with large audiences and most I've ever gotten is one or two people <laughs> ever reaching out to me in the past and uh, inevitably one of them uh, supports what I, whatever it was I said and, and one of them hates it and is never going to fund NPR again or send <laughs> PBS any money and Luke mentioned the Moore Center and our work in the This American Life episode, and um, which is why people contact me. Maybe I've had 200 emails. We're actually tracking this, of course, because we're numbers people. Um, and until recently, I could say that every single one of those had been positive. Uh, and even the one that wasn't positive was not vitriolic. Um, I've been contacted by victims, by the parents of victims who were able to see a little bit more about how this might have happened. Um, certainly I've been contacted to people living with sexual attraction to children who have not offended, those who have, those who um, are fearful that they might. But I've also been uh, uh, contacted by um, people who are living with this attraction but living successfully and safely. And I've been contacted by their siblings and their parents and their wives. Uh, several wives have called me to tell me about the success, success stories that their husbands represent. Um, I've been contacted by students, practitioners, journalists, law enforcement officers who also, all of these people, and, and the general public saying, I never thought about this like that, and now I have hope that there's something we can do uh, to help these people and hope that there's something we can do to prevent it. His work engenders empathy, his and Adam's work, and gender empathy and hope. And I think that could help really drive change. Um, so I'm going to end there <laughs> and bring Luke back to the podium to moderate our own panel of uh, two brave young men who, uh, like Adam, are willing to share their story with a broader audience. Thank you.